Hello. In this clip from our Justia webinar, Charisma in Person and on LinkedIn, Business Development for Attorneys, Scott Mason gives an overview of charisma definitions while discussing myths about charisma and the legal profession, as well as giving tips on how to boost your charisma and help your practice. Remember, if you want to see more Justia videos on law practice and legal marketing, be sure to subscribe to our channel. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. It is good to be here. Let me just do a final little tweak here. And it is good to be here, able to talk to you this afternoon about charisma in person and on LinkedIn business development for attorneys. I'm going to talk about charisma in person. And then as Nina mentioned a few minutes ago, Mark is going to get into how you can translate those skills into LinkedIn and make your business and your law practice into something epic. So before we move any further, let me talk to you a little bit about why charisma matters so much. Both Mark and I are gonna keep it real with you today. Starting off with this very first set of statements. The speed of business in the legal profession is quick and ever-changing. And this requires now more than at any point in history for clients who are faced with massive choices and a whirlwind of a business environment to be able to make fast decisions about who they work with, often based on emotions, first reactions, or the general impression that they may have had of you or other people when they met you a little while back. The hyper-competitiveness of the legal profession, therefore, requires that every attorney who is in the business of building their business in any way whatsoever maximize their impact simply in order to stand out and be remembered. Success in the legal profession often hinges, quite frankly, particularly from a business development perspective, on networking and relationship building, which requires each of us as attorneys to be able to uh, create and put out into the world a version of ourselves that's positive and that people can actually remember, despite some uh, legal issues that we work on that can be distasteful or unpleasant for potential clients. Um, attorneys also have to be able to be easily understood when we speak. We can't just be talking the way we might have in law school, throwing out uh, all sorts of fancy Latin terms or using words like yeah, words that they don't understand, like precedent even is an, is an example. Um, we have to have a compelling message that any potential prospect can understand and that can convey both our knowledge and skill but also that we have the warmth and the ability to uh, be on their side and have their back. I'm going to share briefly an example of someone who lacked this and the devastating impact it had on their business. So for many years, I was part of a business networking group that met at 7 o'clock in the morning. People were already tired and a little bit grumpy simply because we were meeting at 7 a.m. And there was an attorney in the group. And every week when we went around and gave a 30 to 45 second pitch about who we were and what we did, he said the same thing over and over in a monotone without any ability to engage the audience or without any enthusiasm, without any charisma. And it was devastating to see how people would respond. He'd stand up and suddenly that half-eaten piece of bacon from your breakfast a half an hour ago became extremely compelling. Or the clouds in the window outside became these fantastical places that drew everyone's eyes right into them. Bones whipped out. Interestingly enough, I left that networking group, but a few years later, he called me up and asked if I could provide a testimonial or some sort of reference for him. And the tragedy was, I remembered him, and I remembered that he was a lawyer, but I had no idea what he did. I had no idea 
as to any client stories that might have indicated that he had that depth of knowledge. And I had no idea how I could convey that he would care about those who he worked with. It was a tragic demonstration of the devastating impact of not having charisma. I also, before we move on from this slide, do want to point out that there is a moral and an ethical case for making sure that every single person on this webinar both has charisma and is displaying it. And that moral and ethical case is predicated on one assumption that I hope is true for every single person here, and that is the belief that what we do as attorneys members, that people can benefit from what we do, that organizations can survive and have an impact on this planet because of what we do. If we believe that what we or our firms do matter, then we have an ethical obligation to make sure that others know about it and are compelled to utilize our services. If not, they're missing out on something that they need. And so I stand and will die on the hill that being charismatic isn't just nice to build your business, but that each of us have an ethical obligation to be charismatic. And that's why I feel so passionately about this subject. So, who is today's presentation specifically targeting? First of all, any attorney who is seeking to leverage charisma in order to build their business, whether it's through public speaking, um, audio or video platforms like podcasts or YouTube, or any activities involving presentation skills. And that includes presentations before your C-suite, if you're in-house counsel, or if before clients, or at networking groups introverts seeking to build professional and business visibility. We're going to have a specific conversation about introversion and charisma a little bit later in this. And then any lawyers who want to use and effectively uh, build their own charismatic skills to network so they can develop their businesses. I won't go into my bio because... Uh, Nina said more about me than I would ever have said about myself, and, and she said it beautifully. So thank you for that, Nina. Y'all know who I am. Let's briefly talk about what we're going to cover today during my portion. First of all, what charisma is and is not. Number two, what keeps attorneys from being charismatic? Number three, an easy three-point process that you can use to become more charismatic in case you're not. Number four, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, how introverts can become charismatic. And then we're going to review some key takeaways. So let's get right into the meat of this talk. I know y'all have been waiting for it. What is charisma and what is not? Well, this dude, the lawyer stomping down the hall of his firm, that ain't charismatic. But you didn't need me to tell you that. There are some stereotypes about what charisma is and isn't. So let's talk about first what charisma is. There is no clear official definition of what charisma is. It's one of those things where you hear a lot of, oh, I know it when I see it. But the word does have clear historical roots that are relevant to every aspect of our inquiry and our discussion about this today. The word is actually rooted in Greek mythology for any of you who love old myths. There was a goddess named Chorus who was one of the three graces. They were the goddesses that basically attended Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And Chorus was the embodiment of beauty. Beauty of expression in a way, is exactly what charisma was. Now, St. Paul, when he wrote his letters that are have been incorporated into the New Testament around AD 50, uh, listed nine gifts of the Spirit, which I put on the slides here. Knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, and interpretation. And these holy gifts uh, really began to crystallize what we have come to understand as charisma. And the quote I have here from um, the book, uh, The Theory of Social and Economic Organization, summarizes a lot of what some old school thinking about charisma was, that it was a certain magical quality that one might have obtained from God or the gods that gave you the ability to be persuasive and to be a leader. And as lawyers, being leaders and leadership itself are fundamental to who and what we are. But I will disagree with the philosophers 
Charisma isn't any magical gift. It's something that you can learn. And I say that as someone who spent decades of my life with no charisma at all, who would open his mouth and be dull as dirt, boring, dry, bureaucratic, and angry at best. But I turned things around. And we're going to talk about how today. But before we get to that, for the purposes of this conversation, a simple working defin definition of charisma is the power to command attention in order to achieve a positive outcome. The power to command attention in order to achieve a positive outcome. Charisma, for the purposes of this conversation, and we're going to go to the bottom of the slide here first, is not the ability to command attention in order to hurt others or destroy lives. That goes as to the first thing that charisma is not. It's not necessarily tethered to ethics, but for the purposes of this conversation, we're going to focus on positive outcomes. Dark charisma is the subject of a whole other conversation, and there is an excellent book on Hitler's charisma that explains this in depth and is frightening and tragic and horrific all at the same time. What else is charisma not? Number one, it's not the mere act of being entertaining. It's not the ability to stand up in front of a room and speak with massive degrees of demonstrated knowledge or technical expertise. As a matter of fact, that can be quite boring. It's not merely being dramatic or having a high energy level. It's also not necessarily having a huge personality. Vocal volume is not necessarily charisma. We're going to talk about that a lot more later. Universal in its execution or how it's perceived. Charisma is something that's highly individuated and tailored towards an audience. Charisma isn't the same as charm, although charm can and should be part of charisma. They're not identical. And then let's never forget, charisma is not necessarily that you have wisdom, intellect, or even the ability to lead. It is the means to compel people to get behind what you want them to do so you can achieve that positive outcome. It's a tool of galvanization. So what keeps lawyers in particular from being charismatic? I believe there are a series of myths that we tell ourselves inside, um, internalizations of larger cultural narratives. That's why I call them myths that we as lawyers tend to take on as part of our personas and our belief systems, but they hold us back and keep us from being fully what we can be as radiant presences on this planet. The first of these three toxic myths is the social myth. And the social myth is lived out when you are experiencing your life through a series of obligations to fulfill the social expectations of other people whether perceived or actual. So in the case of attorneys, there are large social stereotypes that exist out there about how attorneys behave. If you say to yourself, I need to be a bulldog and stop down the hallway like that cartoon guy Mr. Mason showed me earlier, well, then you're buying into a stereotype and living out a social myth. This type of mindset contrasts with trust, authenticity, and the actual belief or beliefs that your clients, the jurors, or opposing counsel might actually have. So, for instance, I used to sit on a, uh, a board that would make some decisions about people that would apply for a particular service. And sometimes they would come in with lawyers who were attempting to be charismatic, and they were screaming and yelling at this board. And they were buying, in my opinion, into the social myth of lawyers as the bulldog. The problem is we as board members didn't want to hear that. That wasn't what we actually wanted. He was hurting himself and actually being the opposite of charismatic. Next, after the social myth, there is the ritual myth. And that is when you engage in a set of behaviors because it worked at one point in your career, um, but you sort of cement that explanation into your mind as to why you behave that way into a permanent justification for continuing to behave in that way, even when circumstances no longer require it. So for instance, I had to behave a certain way in my career when I started doing litigation in the Bronx. It was a very aggressive style. But when I moved into other areas of my career, particularly executive management or chief legal officer sorts of positions, the CEOs that I worked for 
<laughs> didn't want a Bronx litigator talking to them. So what I was doing by failing to adapt my behaviors to the circumstances because those behaviors had worked once before was live out the ritual myth. This contrasts with the growth mindset that we really need to constantly embrace if we're going to build our businesses and be out there as brands that bring clients and attract them to us um, and, and everywhere else that we might encounter people. And a great place to read about how to embrace a growth mindset is set forth at the bottom of the slide here. The book Mindset by Carol Dweck is a masterpiece and a classic. If you haven't read it, you should. The final of the three toxic myths is the doomsday or the apocalyptic myth. This is when you're afraid to change your behaviors or to learn and exhibit a new type of behavior because you're afraid that you'll fail. In other words, if I change how I present, if I take that risk, and become charismatic in the world, people won't like me anymore and I'll lose my clients, my business will collapse, I'll get fired, all these other things. Again, if you are behaving in a certain way or manifesting your presence in the world in a certain way based on fear, which is what the doomsday myth is all about, then what's happening is you're conveying to others who are observing you on a subconscious level a lack of confidence. They won't trust you, they won't forget, they won't remember you. and hurts you. It keeps you from being able to attract those positive outcomes that are at the core of charisma. So from a mindset perspective, how can you begin to obliterate these toxic myths? First of all, you need to keep it real about the impact of a lot, lack of charisma on your practice and its bottom line. Acknowledgement is the first step. My lack of charisma is hurting my career and it's going to hurt my ability to grow. That can be a hard one. It was a hard one for me to accept because it requires a deep level of honesty and self-criticism, but it's important. Number two, it's important for us as a, just as a matter of logical thinking to weigh the risk of our firm's invisibility or us actually off-putting potential clients with the long-term impact and the long-term impact of this on our financial viability with the, um, with the benefits or against the benefits of actually taking the time and effort to learn how to be charismatic. Now, since the billable hour is what most of us base our work on, remember that our time has value and we, we squander that at our own risk. Anytime we are like that attorney at the networking meeting that I mentioned earlier, and we're up there presenting in a way that bores people or enables them to forget us, we are throwing money down the drain. So assess the cost of your lack of charisma to you honestly and to your clients as well who are not who are potential clients at least who are not accessing what you have to offer and then make that connection between those costs and your bottom line. Then it's time to rewrite the narrative to say that I'm going to commit to the investment necessary to become charismatic so that I can build my business and be there for those out in the world who need me. And that takes us right into what we're going to talk about next, which are three steps to igniting your charisma. First, again, the theme of self-honesty and acknowledgement is core to stepping into your charisma. And it comes up again here. It's really invaluable to take the time to self-assess yourself through the lens of what your full charismatic range is. And we'll explain what that means in a minute. The first thing you want to do is a charismatic diagnostic. You want to begin to ask people to assess you, but you also probably want to begin to record yourself. It might just be getting your iPhone and talking for a few minutes in front of it or making, so doing a little video setup and practicing some of your speeches or your pitches and then reviewing it over and over again. The purpose of this is to A, get practice at being charismatic, just like when you're on trial or with regards to any other practice area. But then number two, you want to be able to note the qualities that you have that are positive. The purpose of this isn't for you to just wag your finger at yourself, but to say, these are the things that make me unique and I want to bring them out. Your uniqueness, the things that go as to the core as to what individuates you are going to be the differentiators that enable other people to remember you. And they're your secret superpowers. Then you want to use your legal skill of issue spotting to focus on these self-expression uh, gems and be able to then 
apply that to assessments that you might do of other speakers. I urge people to spend some time on YouTube and just watch great leaders or great lawyers talk and say, wow, that is someone who's not exactly like me, but based on my own assessment, I could incorporate some of what they do and become more charismatic myself. Then, and this one can be hard for us lawyers, it's important to connect your brain to your art. Brain is about messaging, not just talking, 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 as so many of us lawyers love to do and going off on irrelevancies and citing statutes and case law and all that sort of stuff, but thinking first and foremost, always not about what you want to say, but what the person that you're speaking to wants to hear. So who is that person? Is it a judge? Is it opposing counsel? Is it uh, uh, someone at a networking meeting? And then do you know why they care about what you're saying? Make sure that you understand that because the level of persuasiveness that you want to employ is related to the extent to which they have an interest in what you're saying. And then what then do you want them to take? Anytime you communicate from a business development perspective or from a professional development perspective, what is the action that you want to leave the listener engaged with taking? And you want to engage them to take it through inspiration, not through scolding, not through righteous indignation, not through any of these other things that can become uh, core parts of our public speaking toolbox as attorneys in contexts that are not necessarily appropriate for um, for business development as well as career advancement. Then make sure, and this where is where a lot of lawyers, including me, by the way, have a hard time going, and that is matching your message to emotions, expressing them. You having assessed yourself previously, will understand what your charismatic gems are. Be prepared to bring them in as is relevant to what you're saying. And when you write out your speeches, if this is hard for you, write out literally what emotions you want to express. I do that with every single speech I ever give. The reason I do that is because sometimes it can be easy to get caught up in the moment. But if you're saying to yourself, these are the emotions I, am, I intend to convey, it's more easy to actually remember to bring them out. There are some risks that you need to take in order to be charismatic. And I say this because lawyers are, due to the nature of the work that we do, sometimes very averse to taking risks. But when it comes to charisma and leadership, more generally, I would even argue, the ability to take managed and considered risks is on, almost always only a positive. First of all, make sure that you embrace humor and vulnerability. I've tried to make a few jokes up here. I hope that you all have giggled at least once, but if not, you, I would hope that you all can see that there's a sense of humor that I'm bringing here, even if I'm afraid that it might fall flat, as well as talking about some of my own struggles. That's bringing vulnerability into the room. Connection is tied to these things. There is a famous Toastmaster. Toastmaster is a great public speaking organization who once said to have a successful communication or a public oratory experience, you need to make them laugh. You need to make them cry. You need to make them gasp. You need to make them sigh. If you're talking about something that's boring, let's say you're giving a speech on HIPAA. Use storytelling or hypotheticals that, again, have emotional resonance that you bring into the conversation in order to make sure that those who are listening understand the importance and the power and the emotion behind what you're saying. Improv and stand-up comedy classes are charisma gold if you ever have the chance to take them. And then make sure, by the way, when you're making a joke or, a vulner or being vulnerable, be vulnerable about yourself and make fun of yourself. Don't be putting other people down. And then become fearless. Become fearless. Say to yourself, I'm going to practice in front of friends of mine who will give me feedback that might be harsh or might be painful, but will make me better. That courage, once you utilize it to become more charismatic, will pay off in spades more and more over time as you're out there being a charismatic presence. If you're an introvert, these are my tips. First of all, 
it's important to remember and self-reinforce always what charisma is not. And you can refer to these slides in the future because they're going to be distributed. I once had a 72-year-old woman come up to me and say, Scott, you're six foot one. You're a big strapping man with a loud voice and this personality. I can't be charismatic because I can't be like you. No, you can't be like me and I can't be like her. Remember that charisma is not just being big and loud. It's about being able to convey a message with passion. So make sure that when, if you are an introvert and speaking, you're focusing relentlessly and over and over again on message, message, message. Also, remember that quietness and dramatic pauses can be incredibly powerful. And people will pay attention to you if you utilize them. And that's an introvert's superpower. If you're nervous up there, hand gestures like this for okay or I'm confident in this or this. These sorts of things or having your palms out, not facing yourself, having your palms out are default gestures that you can sort of fall into that may give you a level of physical comfort when you're speaking. And then make sure if you're an introvert to always before a presentation and afterwards schedule downtime so that you are able to Pull up the energy you need to have before you give a presentation, but more importantly, recover from the stress of it and recharge your energy. Too many people, if they're introverts, go just from one meeting to the next without understanding that as an introvert, that need for alone time to recharge is especially important if you are consciously working to convey your charisma. So what are some key takeaways before we get to Mark Halbert? First of all, charisma is the power to command attention in order to achieve a positive outcome. It is not the same as merely being loud and entertaining. A lack of charisma can negatively impact your practices, bottom line, and your career itself. Attorneys tend to lack charisma due to the three toxic myths I discussed earlier associated with personal or professional self-expectations. Changing this underlying narrative within is the key to bringing out your own charisma. Now, as a practical matter, connecting a sharp message, your brain with authentic and appropriate emotion, and then practicing, practicing, practicing allows that power house vocal bow to open up and your charisma will gush right out and if you're an introvert remembering that you can be charismatic by focusing tightly on message personality driven on um, this very specific default uh, techniques such as the body language tools i discussed earlier and allotting downtime before and after any presentation that you have to give so you'll get this information uh, through Justia when this course is over. And if you have any questions for about this and you want to ask them and you're not able to have them um, in, in the immediate aftermath of this presentation, don't hesitate to reach out. I love to meet people and talk to them and help them become charismatic. Because as I said earlier, I want everyone on this call to have a future that is epic. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did enjoy it, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more videos on law practice and legal marketing. See you in our next clip.